Shalom, everyone. And the Nazarene, that's what we're called. There's something for the masses to see, and then there's something for the initiated to see. It's the darkness hiding in open view. We call them Wiccans, witches, warlocks, wizards, shamans. That's what they go by. It's poison doctrine. In the center, the son of man, in a robe and gold breastplate, hair and blist of white, eyes pouring fire blaze, both feet farnest fire bronze, his voice the cataract, right hand holding seven stars, his mouth a sharp biting sword, his face a perigee sun. I saw this and fainted dead at his feet. His right hand pulled me upright, his voice reassured me. Don't fear, I am first, I am last. I am alive, I died, but I came to life. My life is now forever, and I have come to take you home. Let me start off by saying my name is Lou White, in case I haven't met each one of you. But uh, any time that you have a question, or comment, or something you want to add, or take away, <laughs> just uh, just raise your hand and try to get my attention, and we'll stop and, and clarify anything if I can do it, or someone here knows the answer. But uh, I would have all the answers, that's for sure. I'm, I'm just a student, but uh, I'm here to share with you what I've been taught and what I've studied. And uh, this week we're going to study something that is essential. It's, it's imprinted in the scriptures all through, you know, and it's, it's actually, when you read the scriptures, a lot of times you'll be reading along and then it's like a pop-up book, something will really pop up and you'll see a, like a, a two-dimensional figure, you know, what the picture in your head is, what the text is talking about. Well, some of this stuff actually becomes a three-dimensional topic, and uh, some of it actually turns into a movie, because the whole book suddenly comes alive. You know, we're going to talk about Yonah. The guy they call Jonas. We're going to talk about uh, Joseph a little bit, his relationship to Yonah. Joseph was the guy that they call Joseph. Oh, let me turn on my mind. There you go. And, and uh, how Joseph was in the uh, land of Mitzrayim or Egypt, which is in the news today, as you all know. But uh, you know how he reflected the life of Yonah and how they both pre-shadowed or prefigured the Messiah's work. The Messiah's work is in two, there's two works. The first work is accomplished, and that first work involved death. The second work involves life, okay? He does two things. He dies, and he comes alive, okay? And he did that in miniature, but he's going to do it in a much bigger way. Uh, Yosef, when he was in Mitzrayim, was sold by his brothers and assumed to be dead. And he went into a pit, just like Yonah went into a, a big fish. And although water wasn't used, the, the sea of peoples, which is like a sea, uh, Yosef was lost in the sea of people, and then he was raised up from the prison uh, within that nation and became the second in charge, like, just like Yahushua is at the right hand of Yahuwah, you know. Just like he was uh, the right hand of Pharaoh, you know. And then Yonah, when he, he he reflected the two works of Messiah too. When he went in he went in rebellion against Yahuwah's will, because he wanted to see the Assyrians destroyed, they were the enemy of Israel. And he didn't want to go to Nineveh. Nineveh is a representation of the world. And it means fish, city of fish, Nineveh. But uh, interestingly enough, he went in the opposite direction. And he himself was also immersed because, you know, there was a lot taken, you know, of who was responsible for this big storm. And he went into the ocean, and that is a form of death because they thought he was going to die for sure. But then the great fish swallowed him, and he was inside something. Just like the Messiah he is inside us. We're hidden. He's hidden in us. And the word Yonah actually means dove, which is an emblem for the spirit of Messiah. So it's all, you know, it comes together. Anyway, uh, we're going to talk about the two works of the Messiah and how they were prefigured. 
And um, but I'd like to start off with a prayer, the disciples' prayer that we were given as instruction. And this is about words. I've got the idea down here, words matter. Not only the, the definition of the words, but the use of the words. Uh, we're going to start off with that prayer now. We're going to substitute some of the words with the actual or with original words, the living words that were original. Our Father, or our Abba, who is in Shamayim, Kodesh be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on arrest, as it is in Shamayim. Give us this day, or this yom, our daily lakem, our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver Yeshua us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the esteem forever and ever. Amen. <clears throat> now the key thing in that prayer, you'll notice is the word Yeshua. And it means that's his work of deliverance. And that's what the Lamb of Yahuwah is all about, deliverance. But he's delivering us in two ways, and that's what I'm going to try to show you. Deliverance um, involves more than what we've been taught. Corruption. What is corruption? Well, corruption uh, started with, with sin. That was the first uh, problem that we had as the human race. And it dwells within us as sin. Now, I'm going to equate leprosy with sin and decay and death. Because, see, we have spiritual leprosy. Our inner lamb starts off being leprous because we inherited that leprosy that spread from our first parents. Okay? The Catholics have referred to it as original sin. I don't think I've found that actually in the, in the context of any of my prophets, but that idea is more like leprosy and it's spread through contact with you know, sin, and when, we, when we're living in the world, the world system is actually the beast. And the whole world is under the authority of the uh, enemy, the dragon. So if the whole world, if we're friends with the world, then we're enemies with Yahuwah. Of course, the idea of the physical things being the world, that's not what he's talking about. Yahuwah created the physical world. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about the world system, you know. Um, in Matthew 23, verse 25 and 26, Yahushua says to the Pharisees and scribes, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are filled with plunder and unrighteousness. Blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and dish so that the outside of them becomes clean too. Now, following the Lamb, we will also become clean because He will clean us from the inside. And that's one of my personal prayers to him all the time is to purify my heart inside, and then the outside will be clean as well. Now, following the Lamb, in Revelation 14, 4, we see this about describing the Nazarene, you know, that's us, uh, not just this group, but everybody that's ever been on the planet that followed the Lamb. They are those who were not defiled with women, in other words, they were not being idolatrous, nor were they, for they are maidens or, or virgins. They are those following the Lamb, wherever he leads them on. They were redeemed from among men, being first fruits to Elohim and to the Lamb. Now, notice that word redeemed. I've emphasized it here. The word redeemed is a word that we don't have a lot of clarity on, but I want to use this opportunity to clarify that word. And in this picture we see here the synagogue of Capernaum. The word Capernaum actually means something. Does anybody know what it means? Well, kafar means, or kapur, means to cover, and na'um means to comfort or to console. So it, it would probably best be translated into the idea of a covering comfort, you know. And this is his, ba his base headquarters was in kapur. That's where he he launched his ministry. 
So where is the land that we have to seek? He's your redeemer. We use that word redeem. And he paid for your ransom. In the Hebrew, the word ransom and redeem are the very same word. We just obfuscate the word. But ransom and redeem are the same word. Whether at the beginning, middle, or end of your life, you'll find this to be your primary concern. Because when you reach the end of your road, whether you're seven years old or, or 90 years old, you're going to have a problem when you reach that point of your road. Or is there going to be a rescue? Which is also the idea of redemption or ransom. Or will there be no rescue? You should find your land now. Well, here's that leprosy idea again, mortality. The Latin word is mortis. I think the word morte is, uh, isn't it uh, Portuguese? Uh, based upon the mortis. And it means death, because we're, we're walking around in bodies of death. You know, we feel like we're never going to die, but we are. Spiritually, corruption and leprosy was inherited or spread from Adam. And we see here in the, um, well, in the, in the words of Shaul or Paul, in chapter 6, 7, and 8 of Romans, he illustrates the whole idea of the renewed covenant. The whole plan of salvation is laid out in chapter 6, and eight. Picking up in the center of it somewhere in Romans 7, verse 24. Here's what he wrote. Wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? Thanks to Elohim through Yahushua Messiah, our Master. So then, with the mind I myself truly serve the Torah of Elohim, but with the flesh, the law of sin. So the law of sin he's talking about is this decay that we inherited. And it's also inside of us, too. But he's saying, because he's been washed inside of his cup, he's clean. He's saying, with the mind that would be his inner lamb, he serves Yahushua and he serves the Torah. He serves the Torah of Elohim. Now that's interesting, because a lot of people are trying to say, we're not under the Torah. <laughs> the word for redemption in the Hebrew is padah. And it refers to the redemption of our bodies. Ransom. The, the ransom price was the blood of the Lamb of Elohim. And we're going to talk about that, how that works out. In Romans 8, I'm going to read this whole 23 verses, so bear with me and see what pops out at you. There is then no kind of, now no condemnation to those who are in Messiah, Yahushua, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the, the Torah of the Spirit, of the life and Messiah Yahushua, has set me free from the law of sin and death. For the Torah being powerless in that it was weak through the flesh, Elohim having his own son in the likeness of flesh, likeness of flesh of sin, and concerning sin, condemned sin in the flesh, so that the righteousness of the Torah should be completed in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the matters of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the matters of the Spirit. For the mind of the flesh is death, but the mind of the Spirit is life and peace. Because the mind of the flesh is enmity, or hatred, toward Elohim, for it does not subject itself to the Torah of Elohim. Neither indeed is it able, and those who are in the flesh are unable to please Elohim. But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of Elohim dwells in you. And if anyone does not have the spirit of Messiah, this one is not his. And if Messiah is in you, the body is truly dead on account of sin, but the Spirit is life on account of righteousness. And if the Spirit of him who raised Yahushua from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Messiah from the dead shall also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit dwelling in you. So then, brothers, we are not debtors to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you are going to die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of Elohim, these are sons of Elohim. 
that includes daughters. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage, again, to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption, by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of Elohim, and if children, also heirs, truly heirs of Elohim, and co-heirs with Messiah, if indeed we suffer with him, in order that we also be exalted together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the esteem that is to be revealed in us. For the intense longing of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of Elohim. For the creation was subjected to futility, not from choice, but because of him who subjected it, in anticipation that the creation itself also shall be delivered from the bondage to corruption into the esteemed freedom of the children of Elohim. For we know that all the creation groans together and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. And not only so, but even we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit, we ourselves also groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. I, I couldn't resist that. Uh, now, here's a, we're earth people, earth men, and we're fallen right now. We're dying because of the leprosy of sin being spread from the first parents. So we need a redeemer. We need the redemption, which is the word padah. And it has been made for our sakes by the Lamb of Elohim. And I'm going to show you that precedent in the scriptures. This was a fun picture. Rowan Atkinson is this actor named Mr. Bean, and he's corrupt. <coughs> anyway, here he is as an adult, and there he is as a baby. You can have fun with that, like blocking off one side of it. And, yeah. <coughs> yep. Um, now, here's the significance of redemption, how we explain it. This is the significance. Exodus 13, starting in verse 9. And it shall be as a sign to you on your hand, and as a reminder between your eyes, that the Torah of Yahuwah is to be in your mouth, for with a strong hand of Yahuwah, for with a strong hand, Yahuwah has brought you out of this reign. Now, it says, and you shall guard this law. Now, the law he's referring to here is the law to observe Pesach or Passover. In its appointed time, not every Sunday morning, but it, it's a point in time. Now, he goes on further. This, this law, the Passover, is about the land of Elohim and how he's a redeemer and how he redeems the firstborn. You know. Anyway, then he moves on to another subject slightly. And it shall be when Yahuwah brings you into the land of the Canaanites, as he swore to you and your fathers to give to you, that you shall pass over to Yahuwah every one opening the womb and every firstborn that comes from your livestock, the males belong to Yahuwah. But every firstborn of the donkey you were to ransom with a lamb, and if you do not ransom it, then you shall break its neck. And every firstborn of man among your sons, firstborn of man, male firstborn, you are to ransom. Okay? Now, there's a donkey and there's a lamb. Well, this is all, these are all shadows, okay? But they're, they're trying to illustrate the significance and the precedent of redemption, okay? Now, this is way over the heads of most people, but you've got to understand the significance and where, where it was preceded, because it was actually being shown to us back then, and then when it became a reality and Yahushua actually came among us, only a few people got it. Um, now, here's the precedent of redemption uh, more, more clearly explained. In Exodus 13, it continues, And it shall be when your son asks you in time to come, saying, What is this? What is this? What is what? What is this that we're doing? Well, we're trying to explain redemption and how the Lamb is a picture of that. Then you shall say to him, By strength of hand, you who have brought us out of this reign, out of the house of bondage. He had to kill the firstborn. 
And it came to be when Pharaoh was too hardened to let us go, that Yahuwah killed every firstborn in the land of Mizraim, both the firstborn of man and the firstborn of beast. Therefore, I am slaughtering to Yahuwah every male that opens the womb. He's talking about his animals. But every firstborn of my sons, I ransom. Now, he wouldn't slaughter the firstborn of a donkey because that's an unclean beast. He'd use a lamb instead. But every firstborn, you know, male was basically uh, to be slaughtered, you know, and offered to Yahuwah. And uh, every firstborn male child had to be ransomed. Now, it shall be as a sign on your hand and as frontless between your eyes. For by strength of hand, Yahuwah brought us out of Mitzrayim. Now, we have the Messiah now as our Redeemer. We don't use lambs today. Because the priesthood, the Louis, or Louis, Louisical priesthood, the descendants of this man named Louis, uh, that priesthood was established for one purpose. Now, pay attention, because this is going to be very controversial. He, he, the, the whole priesthood was established to deliver Yahushua as the Lamb. And that sounds really crazy at first to think about it. All the lambs and all the bulls were all pictures and forerunners of what they were ultimately appointed to do. And there was another single Luwico priest who they called John the Baptist, who was the announcer of that very act. And he identified the lamb. Now, here we go. Yahushua's parents were observant of Torah. And I put parents in quotes because, you know, uh, he was not the son of Yosef. In Luke 2, verse 22, 24, And when the days of her cleansing, according to the Torah of Moshe, were completed, they brought him, that's Yahushua, to Yerushalayim to present him to Yahuwah, as it has been written in the Torah of Yahuwah. Every male who opens the womb shall be called set apart to Yahuwah, and to give an offering according to what is said in the Torah of Yahuwah, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now, why two young pigeons or turtle doves? Well, those are the two works of the Messiah. One is death, and the other one is life. Okay? That's also true of the two goats. Now, let me mention the two goats for just a moment. The two goats were offered on... They were offered on uh, Yom Kafar, you know, and they were selected. Which one was which was selected by the lottery. You know, they cast lots. Well, they cast lots for Yom too, remember? <laughs> which one was going to have to die? Well, they cast lots for Yahushua's clothing, too. So the, the linkage between these three things are all there. You know, I hope I'm not making that up. Let me see if I can back this up just a minute. Okay, now every now in first Yahukan three, we read this. Everyone doing sin also does lawlessness. And sin is lawlessness. And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins. And in him there is no sin. Now there you go. See you might have overread that at times, but he's one of those goats. The goats were a picture of what he was doing. The two works of Yahuwah, or Yahusha, is to take away sin, a cover, to, to cover sin and to take away sin. And I'm going to show you what those differences are. They're pretty major, really. One is death, and the other one is life. To cover sin involves death. But to take away sin is a completely different operation. It, it re re involves our redemption. And our redemption has not, it's been paid, the recovery has been paid, but when he resurrects us, then we'll be really redeemed. And sin will be permanently removed, okay, from those that he redeems. He's covered it, and, and the penalty for, for that is, is removed. But now, there's a second work that's ahead. Now, a lamb in the Hebrew involves goats. I mean, the word lamb is say. Now, it includes sheep or any small member of the flock. You know, it wouldn't probably be a large bull, but it would be 
small little things like goats. So goat, lamb, you, or whatever, they were all the same word, the same. Hebrew word 7716. Anyway, you see the high priest in this illustration, and he's uh, going to have to select one of the goats, and he does this, and then he ties a red ribbon, symbolic of sin, upon one of the goats. And that's the one that's turned loose, the one that's been leaves, you know, just like the Hushalite. So he became the sin bearer. And the other one was, was executed or, or slaughtered. Uh, now here's the prophecy. One lamb was to be made an offering. In Yeshiyahu 53, this is where the lamb's work actually is emphasized. Who has believed our report? And to whom was the arm of Yahuwah revealed? For he grew up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or splendor that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should desire him, despised and rejected by men, a man of pains and knowing sickness, and as one from whom the face is hidden, being despised, and we did not consider him. Truly he has borne our sicknesses and carried our pains, yet we reckoned him stricken, smitten by Elohim and afflicted. Now, who's speaking there is the we would be Israel, you know. And this is when they come to their senses. But you see the word padah, which means redeem or ransom. And it's written on the head of this lamb, too, because he became that. And the Ethiopian eunuch that Philip was talking to in the book of Acts, I think it was around chapter 8, he was talking to this, he was reading in his chariot these words. And he said, who is he talking about? What is it? What does it mean? And then Philip explained it to him, and then, Yahushua, and then Philip had him immersed because he, he understood. He needed redemption. One lamb was to be made an offering. And this continues. But he was pierced for our transgressions. Our transgressions. He was bruised for our crookednesses. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. We all, like sheep, went astray, each one of us, has turned to his own way. And Yahuwah has laid on him the crookedness of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, but he did not open his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shears is silent. But he did not open his mouth. You know, it's the matzah that reminds us of his body, uh, is bruised and, and, and it's pierced and striped. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And as for his generation, who considered that he shall be cut off from the land of the living? For the transgression of my people, for the transgression of my people, he was stricken. And he was appointed a grave with the wrong and with the rich at his death, because he had done no violence, nor was deceit in his mouth. And uh, Pilate, you know, was uh, listening to the crowds shouting, away, away, impale him. And he said, shall I impale your sovereign? And then the chief priests answered, we have no sovereign except Caesar. Oh boy, that's like the serpent kings of this world. They want you to worship them. You know, we talk about that a lot. All these governors, dictators, presidents, rulers, they all want you to worship them. They don't want you to ever come in. They have something higher, you know. Now, in... In the, in the book of John, in chapter 12, it says, Now this is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world shall be cast out. And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, shall draw all men unto myself. And then we're going to continue with uh, Yeshiyahu 53. But Yahuwah was pleased to crush him. He had laid sickness on him, that when he made himself an offering for guilt, he would see a seed. He would prolong his days, and the pleasure of Yahuwah prosper in his hand. He would see the result of the suffering of his life and be satisfied. Through his knowledge, my righteous servant makes many righteous, and he bears their crookednesses. Therefore, I give him a portion among the great, and he divides the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his, his being unto death, 
and he was counted with the transgressors, and he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. You see how that relates to the goat? You know. And then we have this serpent that was lifted up in the wilderness because Yahushua said to Nicodemus that as the serpent was lifted up, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. As our shepherd, Mashiach announced the reign of Yahuwah. But the establishment, those are religious men, rejected it. And that's what he's saying in this text right here. The Torah and the prophets are until Yahuwah. That's John the Immersion. Since then, the reign of Elohim is being announced and everyone is doing violence upon it. They didn't like what Yahuwah was saying. Now that means, doing violence means failing to repent and obey the Torah. That's what he was calling them to, repentance. John was also known as John the Baptist. Now he was the first to identify the Lamb. He was a Levitical priest, and he was the culmination of the entire Levitical priesthood to deliver the Lamb to be executed. In, in John chapter 1, now this isn't the same John. <laughs> He is a witness. There was a man sent from Elohim whose name was Yehuchan. This one came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all might believe through him. He was not that light, but that he might bear witness of that light. Now Yehuchan represents the Louis, the Louis, the priesthood. And the purpose of the priesthood was to deliver and offer, I mean to deliver up or offer the land of Elohim. Now, immersion is a death, and that's what happened when he came, when Yahushua came to Yahushua to be immersed. That was a symbol of his death, okay? And I want to point out that at the time Yahushua came into the water, that a dove appeared. And that was a symbol of Yonah. That was the symbol of what happened to Yonah. And it was also a symbol of the first work. Of Yahuwah. You see that the work of Yahuwah involves life, a death and then life. So the first dove was a symbol that was appearing there. And that was the Ruach HaKadosh. And it was coming down like a dove. And that dove represented the first work. The dove appeared to show the first work, the cleansing of leprosy. After immersion, we are legally declared clean in the Shia. Now, it's just a legal pronouncement. Okay? We're not yet redeemed when we're immersed. That's why we're still struggling with sin. But you see, we're going to be redeemed and sin will be actually removed and it won't be anymore. And the temptation will be there because we'll be fully inhabited by Him. See, right now, we've got us a little down payment. We're legally clean our, if, if we're immersed. If so if you are having troubles, maybe because you're not immersed. But you're going to have other troubles later. It's going to probably get more intense. But it'll be different kinds of trouble. Now, our bodies of sin and death, which are leprous, are subjected to death. And at the second appearance of Yahushua, our new body will be incorruptible. And it will be free of all leprosy. Now, that's the, that's the other dove, by the way. There's the first dove, <laughs> you know, and he represents, is the dove that went into the fish. That's the only one into the fish. Like Yahushua comes into us. Okay? I wanted to point that illustration out too. Now, this man that we call Yahushua was, uh, I mean, Yahuka, or John the Baptist, he was Yahushua's cousin. And he's identified, he identified the land of Elohim. Now, Malachi 3 1 actually predicted him. How many people that you and remember in all your study of scripture, have been predicted to be coming other than the Messiah. Well, they predicted that he was going to be coming. See, I am sending my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. Then suddenly the master you are seeking comes into his heckle, that's the temple, even the messenger of the covenant, in whom you delight. See, he is coming, said Yahuwah of hosts. And then we read in John 1, 29, on the next day, Yehuchanan Yuh saw Yehusha coming toward him and said, See, the Lamb of Elohim, who takes away the sins of the Lord. He identified him as the goat. <clears throat> now, he's the priest, he would know. The Lamb's scroll of life contains the names of those redeemed by the Lamb's blood. The pattern began in the garden, though, all the way back in the Garden of Eden. 
and it was actually just after sin entered the world. Genesis 3, 21 says, And Yahuwah Elohim made coats of skin for the man and his wife, and dressed them. And that covering cost the, the life of at least one lamb, but probably two lambs. Anyway, that's another image of two things, a redemptive work, you know. Now, Yahuwah will provide himself a lamb. Genesis 22, we read further, And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering. Does the wood remind you of anything that Yahushua might have been carrying? You know, when he was being executed? Well, he took the wood and he put it on his son, Yishai. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and the two of them went together. And Yishak spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father. And he said, Here I am, my son. And he said, See the fire and the wood? But where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son Elohim does provide himself the lamb for a burnt offering. And the two of them went together. And he probably didn't understand what he was even saying but it was put into his mouth at that time. You know, a lot of times you'll be talking to someone, witnessing to them, and then suddenly words fly out of you. That you have no comprehension where you're even in there. And that's because you're being inspired. Now, you notice that Abraham lifted his eyes, and he looked, and he saw behind him a ram caught in a bush by its horns. Now, that uh, is interesting. This is after, you know, he was about to slay his son as an offering. But then he was stopped by a messenger. And then he said, well, I've got, I've got this altar here. I've got to offer something. And then he saw this, this ram caught in a bush by its horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it for a burnt offering instead of his son, in place of his son, just like Yahushua died in place of us. And Abraham called the name of the place Yahuwah Yareh, and it is said on this day on the mountain of on the mountain Yahuwah provides. Because that's what it means, Yahuwah provides. Now there's, this, there's the thicket that's illustrated on the, on the Messiah's head. The symbol of sin, thorns that were brought forth as a result or a consequence of sin. The only way provided by Yahuwah is the lamb. In John 14, or Yahuwah 14, it says, Yahushua said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father too. From now on, you know him and have seen him. Now here's a, another illustration of uh, the high priest putting the sins of Israel upon the head of a ram or a goat. In Leviticus 16, starting in verse 21, it says, Then Acheron shall lay both his hands on the head of, a, of the live goat, and shall confess over it all the crookednesses of the children of Israel, and all their transgressions, and all their sins, and shall put them on the head of the goat, and shall send it away into the wilderness by the hand of a fit man. And the goat shall bear on itself all their crookednesses to a land cut off. Thus he shall send the goat away into the wilderness. And by the soldier placing his hands upon these thorns and putting his hands upon the head of the Messiah, the Lamb of Elohim, he placed the sins on, on Yahushua. Even though he wasn't a high priest, it was just a man. Because he was actually the high priest, and he was putting it on the head of the high priest. But anyway, thorns are associated with the curse of sin, and they're symbolic of sin's curse. Thorn is placed on Yahushua's head as sin bearer. Genesis 3 says, And to the man, he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife, and have eaten of the tree, of which I commanded you, saying, Do not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you are to eat of it all the days of your life, and the ground shall bring forth thorns and thistles for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. Now sin is the bite of the serpent also. It's the symbol. And the people spoke, and we're reading in Numbers 21, starting in verse 5 now. And the people spoke against Elohim and against Moshe. Why have you brought us up out of Mitzrayim to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and our being loathes this light bread. 
And Yahuwah set fiery serpents upon the people, and they bit the people, and many of the people of Israel died. Then the people came to Moshe and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against Yahuwah and against you. Pray for Yahuwah to take away the serpents from us. So Moshe prayed on behalf of the people, and Yahuwah said to Moshe, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole. And it shall be that, every, that everyone who is bitten, when he looks at it, shall live. So Moshe made a bronze serpent and put it on a pole. And it came to be, if a serpent had bitten anyone, when he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. Now this was in the, the, the 1400 something, 1400 years BC when this happened. They're in the wilderness, you know. And here's some Greek people that started out around 300 BC, over a thousand years later. Because the adversary is a counterfeiter. He's a big identity thief, and he's a big Im imitator. He wants to be like Elohim. Yehud. Now, imitation is the highest form of flattery. So when, he, when the Greeks adopted a, a healing deity, there was a serpent on a pole. And we see it today in the medical profession. Of course, they don't know consciously that they're inheriting this from, ne from ne Nehushtan or Moshe and Yahuwah himself. But the, the, the Greeks adopted it. And the pagan healing idols were modeled after the pattern given to Moshe around 1446 BCE. Because, you, because Shaitan, or Satan, seeks to be like the Most High. Now in the center here, you'll see a picture of a statue, which is a, kind of an amalgamation of this deity plus the Statue of Liberty, which is actually, you know, uh, A-S-H-E-R-A-H. Anyway, we see humanism's real, uh, or healing symbol, healing idol. This thing is in Scottsdale, Arizona, and it's a cursed thing. It's a Masonic phoenix of sorts. In Second Kings, we read of this uh, incident where they were burning incense to this idol of healing with the serpent. He took away the high places, 2 Kings 18.4, he took away the high places and broke the pillars. These are standing stones, like obelisks, because Yahuwah hates those. And cut down the A-S-H-E-R-A-H, -E and broke in pieces the bronze serpent which Moshe had made, for until those days the children of Israel burned incense to it, and called it Nehushtan. Here we see the egg that uh, the Babylonian deity hatched out of and the uh, supposed uh, Euphrates. And we see the serpent. Actually, there's two of them there. And then we see the, the spikes and all that stuff. Now, as the serpent was lifted up, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And no one has gone up into the heaven except the he who came down from the heaven, the Son of Adam. And as Moshe lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so, the Son of Adam has to be lifted up. So that whoever is believing in him should not perish, but possess everlasting life. So the, the lamb's wounds that were, you remember, they had to put the blood of the lamb on the doorposts and the lintel of the houses that they were in when they were in Mitzrayim. That was also the same thing. It's, we need to be protected, we need to have a covering, and this is what the lamb's first work is. It involves death. The leprosy of sin spread from Adam to all mankind, and it brings with it death. Now, the two doves. In Leviticus 14, we read about the, the cure for leprosy. But this is just a small shadow picture of what really is going on spiritually. And Yahuwah spoke to Moshe, saying, This shall be the Torah of the leper for the day of his cleansing. He shall be brought to the priest, and the priest shall go out of the camp, and the priest shall look and see if the leprosy is healed in the leper. Then the priest shall command, and he shall take for him who is to be cleansed two live and clean birds, and cedar wood, and scarlet, and hyssop. We see the hyssop was reflecting back to the blood that was being putting, put on the doorposts. The wood that Yahushua carried, and, you know, Ishak carried too, remember? Um, and scarlet, and that's an interesting thing too, because the first dove was to be killed, and the second dove 
was to be dipped in its blood with the wood. That's an interesting thing. So it isn't just about leprosy, physical leprosy. It's about spiritual leprosy and the picture that this holds for all of us to learn from it. Now, what else do we have here? Uh, the priest, okay, he shall take from his, be cleansed two lion and clean birds. Okay. Anyway, these are the two works of the Messiah. The two doves, and the priest shall command and he shall kill one of the birds in an earthen vessel. In other words, the Messiah was in an earthen vessel. Over running water, which is, of course, symbol of the sea of humanity. Oops, back up. Let him take the live bird and the cedar wood and the scarlet and the hyssop and dip them in the live bird and the blood of the bird that was killed over the running water. You see these symbols? It's amazing. And he shall sprinkle it seven times on him who is to be cleansed from the leprosy, and shall pronounce him clean. This was a legal pronouncement, okay? You're legally clean, you know. And, and shall let the live bird loose in the open field. Now, that's an interesting thing, too. That's another symbol. That's the second work. That's those, the life work. And we have a death work and we have a life work. The first work directly related to the second work because Yahushua's robe was dipped in blood. And that's what the scarlet cord was, you know. Revelation 19.11 says, I saw the heaven open, and there was a white horse, and he who sat on him was, was called trustworthy and true, and in righteousness he judges and fights. And his eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, having a name that had been written, which no one had perceived except himself. And having been dressed in a robe, dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of Yahuwah. So, I think we've learned quite a few little things from the text there, and made connections. But, uh, as the redeemed, you know, we, we can learn from these words here in Proverbs 3. Do not be afraid of sudden dread, nor of the ruin of the wrong when it comes. For Yahuwah is at your side, and he shall guard your foot from being caught. In Psalm 91, it says, For he, who, for he delivers you from the snare of the trapper, from the, destruction, from the destructive pestilence, and he covers you with his feathers, and under his wings you take refuge. His truth is a shield and armor. His truth, that would be his Torah, what he's put in your heart. You are not afraid of the dread by night, of the arrow that flies by day, of the pestilence that walks in darkness, of destruction that ravages at midday. Now, we're going to be facing some things in this world as we see this thing, because there's a spiritual and a physical plague that's, that's unleashing, actually several of them. And then it's continuing. A thousand shall fall at your side, and ten thousand at your right hand, but it does not come near you. Only with your eyes you look on and see the reward of the wrong ones, because you have made Yahuwah my refuge, the, high, the most high, your dwelling place. No evil befalls you, and a plague does not come near your tent. For he commands his messengers concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They bear you up in their hands, lest you dash your foot against a stone. You tread upon lion and cobra, Young lion and serpent, you trample on your foot, because he cleaves it to me in love. Therefore, I deliver him. I set him on high, because he has known my name. Let's remind you of uh, John chapter 3. When he calls on me, I answer him. I am with him in distress. That's the day of distress, the great tribulation. I deliver him and esteem him. With long life, I satisfy him and shall show him my Yeshua. That's what the word deliverance is. In Yeshua 54, it says, For your maker is your husband. Yahuwah of hosts is his name. And the set apart one of Yisrael is your redeemer. He is called the Elohim of all the earth. No weapon formed against you shall prosper, and every tongue which rises against you in judgment you shall prove wrong. This is the inheritance of the servants of Yahuwah, and their righteousness from me, declares Yahuwah. Now he's able to save completely. Hebrews 7, verse 25 says, Therefore he is also able to save completely those who draw near to Elohim through him, 
if ever living to make intercession for them. He's our high priest. For it was fitting that he should have such that we should have such a high priest, kind, innocent, undefiled, having been separated from sinners and exalted above the heavens, who does not need, as those high priests, to offer up slaughter offerings day by day, first for his own sins and then for those of the people. For this he did once for all, when he offered up himself. <clears throat> anyway, here's a synopsis of what we're all about. Not serene, we're given a commission, a co-mission with Yahushua, and his second work, the one that we've been kind of fuzzy about up to now, is not death, but it's life. And it means that we're to go and we're to share what this dove that's hiding in our hearts has to say to the people around us. Because he is like Yonah. First he died. He went into the ocean, into the sea. And then he was resurrected from the fish. At that point, we're at the second work. The dove, that's what Yonah means, went to Nineveh, which is the world, and he preached, and that's what we're to do. Okay? Matthew 28 says, Therefore go and make taught ones of all the nations, immersing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the set apart Spirit, teaching them to guard all that I have commanded you. In other words, the Ninevites are going to have to listen. And they're going to listen very intently after the first resurrection. Because we're not going to be looking like this. We're going to be glowing. We're going to be walking through walls. We're going to be going at the speed of thought. And they're going to say, whatever they're saying, we're going to have to listen. Now that's the, the message of life. Now, and see, I am with you always. That's what he told Joshua, or Yahushua, that was his real name. Until the end of the age. Amen. So the Nazarene are the guardians, the watchmen, and we guard the name and we guard the Torah. We teach them the name. That's what it says in the first part of the reference. Go and teach them the name. Okay? Immerse them in the name. You know. It, 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 we get too tied up in the physical thing. Do that too. But, you know, give them the name. Don't obfuscate. Don't say, oh, well, it doesn't matter what we're calling. We're going to go through Portuguese first. No? Let's go back to the Hebrew. And then teach them the Torah of Yahuwah. That's what he taught them to obey. You know, not part of it, not six of them, but all ten. You know. You know, I was discussing with a man uh, on the internet by email, back and forth, a uh, man named Alan. A very uh, knowledgeable person, very Christian. But he said, oh no, we're not under the law. Uh, you know, and then I asked him, well, you mean we don't have to keep, we, we can't steal or commit adultery or covet, but we can break Sabbath and eat ham sandwiches. But we still have to tithe. You know, you know, well, we're supposed to do all of it, you know. But this is the end of the seminar. And he said he would not, we would not see him again until we said, Baruch Hava Hashem Yahuwah, which is blessed is the one coming in the name of Yahuwah. And we've got two destinations we can choose. If we choose the Lamb and follow the Lamb wherever he leads, then we're going to, we have a destination, the new Yerushalayim. Or we can just wind up there. The bond of love between us is because we are begotten. The reason that we love one another is because we are begotten. And we have to love those that are begotten. That's what this says in 1 John, we can, or 1 John 5. Everyone who believes that Yahushua is the Messiah has been begotten of Elohim. And everyone who loves the one begotten also loves the one having been begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of Elohim. When, the love of, we, when we love Elohim and guard his commands. And I mentioned here the Muslim Brotherhood does not believe that Yahushua is Mashiach, which means that it's difficult to love them, but we're commanded to love our enemies. And the word Hamas is their code name. They actually go under that code name. So when you hear the word Hamas, you're talking about the Muslim Brotherhood. And it's a word that actually means violence. You can check that in the dictionary or the internet. And it also, if you read the word violence, the word violence means ferocity, terrorism, disorder, harshness, or wildness. And remember, Ishmael was to be a wild donkey? Oh, okay. And then 
then, uh, anyway, some of these are routines. Um, Mitzrayim, or Egypt, okay, is a metaphor for the world. So is Nineveh. It's the beast system, you know, the whole beast system. And the serpent kings. See, these guys wanted to look like snakes. The, you know, the hood of a cobra. That's what this whole Pedras thing is. And there were serpent kings. They're in India and China and all around. And, uh, and we, if, we, if we look at Exodus 10, or Shemot 10, we see Pharaoh's servants said to him, Till when would this one, Moshe, be a snare to us? Let the, man, let the men go so that they serve Yehuda, their own heath. Do you not yet know that Mitzrayim is destroyed? The plagues are coming upon the beast system. So the beast system is going to be destroyed. And all we have to do is just let the people go, you know, or they need to let the people go. Anyway, that's the end of that. Any uh, questions or comments? Question. Yes, sir? When you're, we're talking about how they ran the water over the dove uh, and the skeleton. When the Yahushua was on the, on the cross, did it uh, start after he gave up the set of our spirit? Did it start to rain or something? Or have it opened up? Well, I, I do know that there was darkness uh, for the, 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 what was it, three hours uh, over the land. Uh, anybody have a comment on that? Does it mention rain? I don't think so. No. We, uh, the, dove, the dove, the the two doves actually were the two works of Messiah, even though it involves leprosy. It's picturing something else. It's pointing to something else. So it's like, you know, when, when a person... Uh, misses the point. They're looking at the finger instead of what the finger is pointing to. You know, the doves are pointing to something, and it's pointing to the work of death and life. The one that died, okay. The second one was dipped in its blood with cedar wood and hyssop and a red cord. And these are symbols of things. And that red cord, of course, would of course be. The thing that the, the goat was released with, the, the sin, it would carry away the sin, you know. And it was to be released in an open field. So the sin would be carried away, just like the goat would wander into the wilderness. And then come, it would come back with the sin removed, because the, the, the little cord was supposed to change to white, you know. And uh, that would actually happen, you know. The goat would leave, and it would come back with, its, with the thing, you know, change colors. Yes, sir? But it didn't say that the first dove was killed under rainwater. Over. Over. Right. Killed under rainwater. Over. Blood. Very good point. Away. Yes, I, I heard him say that, and that's uh, what, it, what it really was about. It was about over running water. The running water would, of course, have to have something to do with immersion. But... You know, it would be the spirit was hovering above the waters, and the waters are an emblem of the sea of humanity. You know. Yes? How did they accomplish the running water in the temple? Did they do that by pouring the water into the basin as the mud went in? Or? I imagine that they had to do it in some symbolic way, because these were all symbols pointing to something else. You know, and it was about, it's all about Yahushua. That's who it's about. And if we, if we fail to see what it's about, I mean, I mean, even though we haven't discovered these things up until now, maybe, uh, that's fine. But the fact that we understand things at a deeper level is really, really good. But it's what it's pointing to. Yeah. So running water symbolizes living water. Is that right? Living water, yes. Living water is moving water. Water that's not uh, stagnant like the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea is dead because it's not moving on. Moving on. You see, he said, I, I am the living water. Yes. And it's supposed to flow into us and then out into others. And you see, if we just take it in and just hold it, and it doesn't move, the living water, which is an emblem of the Torah, of the spirit of Yahushua, the mind of the spirit, uh, if it doesn't pass through us and into others, then we're going to be dead. You know, just like James or Yarakob, Yahushua's half-brother, said, uh, you know, we have to have evidence of our faith. You know, it works. Yeah, that's a very good question. Yeah. Did that answer your question? Okay, no? Please, sir. Okay.
Yes, sir. The guy asked a question of your how he got the run of the water. The spring of Gahanna is a uh, well that runs itself, and they just basically piped it up and piped it through the temple to have this run of water. Uh -huh. But I uh, discovered this uh, somewhat by accident that, uh, you know, I, I really didn't even know what I was going to talk about today. And then, uh, you know, I prayed to Yahushua to teach me what he wanted me to learn to, to teach you. And that would be uh, what he showed me. You know, that the doves, the two doves and the two goats, were very simply uh, illustrations of what Yahushua actually performed. And we're looking back on that. But uh, right now, we're in a life work, not a death work, where we're actually part of the dove is in us. That would be the spirit of Mashiach dwelling in us, just like Yona was in the great fish. And we're going to be resurrected, just like he was. <laughs> I just thought, man, this is like a movie or something. You know, it's like all these things are pictures of what Yahushua is doing. And his life work is to go into the world, which is Nineveh, through us, in us, and tell them, repent. Here's the Torah. Obey this. And we're going to do that after the resurrection as well as before. You know, before our resurrection. We're doing it now. You know, so that there's, first of all, there is a first fruits group. And then the first fruits group is going to be working in that thousand year period. You know. So, and then there's going to be a, a many, many more saved after that. Last, uh, last month we talked about the, the two resurrections, and this ties in perfectly with that. Yeah. Well, any, uh, any more questions? Yes, sir? i got three questions that are kind of like side pages. Um, the, the first one is kind of nitpicky because in, in the disciples' prayer, you said, forgive us our trespasses. Uh -huh. And I was wondering if that, if some versions say, forgive us our debts. Well, that's because sin is a debt. In the Hebrew mindset, sin is actually accruing a debt against Yahuwah first. And if we have uh, offended someone else, then we have accrued a debt towards them. That debt has to have some sort of atonement or settlement. So that it would be okay to use that word? Trespasses is a an old English type word, yeah, and it means the same essential thing, it's a debt. And that's a very good thing, because it is a debt in the Hebrew mind. It's very, very good. And you said that, um, that, that the people of Nineveh represented the whole world. Yes. And uh, I was curious that the Ninevites, they worship the A-G-O-N. Yeah. So would, would that have, I mean, is that, does that have to do with the whole world, like, what worship that deity? Is that or is that just for those specific people there? Well, all the, all the false deities represent Hashatan, but uh, the fish thing was very prevalent, not only in Nineveh, but Assyria, and of course, uh, you know, the Christians and the Greeks, and, and of course, uh, over in, uh, in, in England, you know, the Druids. Uh, they, they all, everybody's been into these fish, you know because they associated the fish eggs with fertility. And of course, the pagan religions were all based upon fertility, and the practices were involving, you know, sexual activity. Okay. Yeah, I, I guess it is if it's a clean fish. But the thing of it is, the, the, the eggs were so prolific, and that was a symbol of, of great fertility. But I think that was basically all that there was to it, you know. Wait, did you have a third question? Yeah. Um, was Abraham still alive at uh, the birth of the twelve? Uh, is he still alive? Oh, that's a good question. I don't have a timeline in front of me right this minute, and I have studied that, but uh, as far as I'm aware, Melchizedek was certainly alive, and we some assume that he was Shem, and we know that uh, he would have been able to learn directly from Shem many things, because he was a priest, you know. 
that, uh, you know, they say he had no beginning and no ending, or no, no father or mother. Uh, and I, I don't know if that means that he's actually Yahusha as a, as a sort of a, what do they call it, uh, yeah, yeah. a theophany. Um, or if they mean by that idiom, idiomatically that he came from another world because of the free flood area. And then, you know, by the time you're on this side of the flood, you know, you don't have a father and mother, but, you know, we know we have a father and mother, you know, uh, no one, you know. But that's why it's kind of problematic. We can't really set that in concrete. But it could have been Shem, but it could have also been uh, Theophany. Yeah. It, could have been, it could have been Noah. Could have been, but uh, most people assume it to be Shem if it was a human being. Yeah, but to answer your question, you'd have to look at a timeline and analyze that. I don't know what the significance would be, but it would be uh, nice if we had more connectivity with our older people so that we can learn more, you know, about things, eyewitnesses. The only reason I ask is because uh, recently we heard a speaker say that Abraham is long dead and gone. You mean the 12 tribes? You mean Israel's sons? Right. Yeah. Well, I would. I would say that, that would be. I would, if I were just a guessing man, I would say definitely. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. Wouldn't it be? For some reason, I was thinking he was alive. Yeah, it is. I mean, great grandparents uh, hung around for a while. Makes sense. Yes, sir. Didn't Abraham live to be 175? You know, I don't recall that. I haven't got all those numbers. And I'm pretty sure that that Jacob was born when I was, I think, 35 or 36 years old, somewhere in there. So Abraham was still been alive when Jacob was born. Mm -hmm. But how do you like the... In the center, the Son of Man, in a robe and gold breastplate, hair blistered of white, eyes pouring fire blaze, both feet farnessed fire bronze, his voice a cataract, right hand holding seven stars, his mouth a sharp biting sword, his face a perigee sun. I saw this and fainted dead at his feet. His right hand pulled me upright, his voice reassured me. Don't fear, I am first, 
I am last. I'm alive. I died, but I came to life. My life is now forever, and I have come to take you home. Thank you.